Hi, everyone. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my new book. It's Ink Free Under Bounds. The book is with Oxford. It's open access, so you can go to the University Press website and um, just read it there. I want to give you a couple minute overview of the book. And then if you want to stick around, I'll give a bit of a longer overview of what I do in the book. And I, I really like handouts. So I've got a handout for um, the overview. The starting point of the book is two turns that have happened in the last 50 or 60 years in the study of human rationality. The first is a turn to bounded rationality. We have internal bounds to us as creatures. We have limited cognitive abilities. We, we pay costs for exercising these abilities. And there are also external bounds. We are in an environment we didn't pick, and that environment structures the success or failure of our cognitive strategies. So bounded rationality says, let's study how internal and external bounds impact the rationality of cognition. Herb Simon said the fundamental turn in the study of bounded rationality is the turn from substantive to procedural rationality. What did he mean? Well, actually, he said it two different ways, but the way I think we should read it is it theories of substantive rationality ask questions about attitudes? What's it rational to believe or intend or desire or prefer? Or what's a rational credence? And theories about procedural rationality just go a level up. How is it rational to deliberate or inquire about what to believe or intend or desire or prefer? And so on. Now you put these two turns together. What do you need? Well, the first turn says we need a theory of bounded rationality. Procedural turn says less about attitudes, more about inquiry. So you put them together, we need a theory of rational inquiry for bounded agents, i.e. a theory of inquiry under bounds. And so that's what I want to do in this book. A bit more specifically, I want to introduce the theory or rather the paradigm of bounded rationality against a competing paradigm you're going to see a lot in decision theory in the social sciences called the standard picture. Then I want to give you an account. I said I'd give you an account of rational inquiry under bounds, so I'll give you an account of rational inquiry under bounds. I'll argue for the account, a couple chapters arguing for the account. And then I want to apply the account to shed light not only on bounded rationality, but also on things like coherence, like structural rationality, and very importantly about the epistemology of inquiry. All right, that's the short version. Long versions, the book's got four parts. So part one is going to tell you a little bit about the standard picture is what we're reacting against, and then a little bit about bounded rationality is what we're moving towards. Standard picture theorists, the term dates back to Edward Stein. He had a book um, without good reason in the 80s, really um, made a big impact on the field. Are people who think consistency or coherence or maybe structural rationality, if that's, if that's broader, exhausts rational norms. And you'll see this in particular in decision theory when you'll have preference axioms that look like um, structural axioms. And you'll also see this in places like the heuristics and biases program, which is just going to pull norms out of the standard picture. We'll come back to that in a second, because in the middle of the century, you know, the 50s, the 60s, economics was doing great. What was our descriptive theory? Humans are literally well modeled in almost all situations by very simple forms of the standard picture. And what was our normative theory? Well, that's what they ought to do. So this was great. Humans, what did they do? The standard picture. What should they do? The standard picture. And we had rationality um, as a descriptive and a normative theory. There were, of course, challenges. And I think they heated up around the 70s and the 80s with um, Kahneman and Tversky's here's and Biases program. They said, look, there are demonstrable systematic ways in which people break standard picture norms. Don't exaggerate how often these happen. One of the messages of the Boundary Rationality Program is they might not happen that often. But certainly a lot of people started to think that we would need descriptively to supplement the standard picture with some violations of the standard picture. OK, what do you do about these violations? Well, you can blame two things. You can blame the agent. You can say normative theory, standard theory, picture's right. Coherence is a rational requirement. Transitive preference is a rational requirement. Your favorite non-bias condition is a rational requirement. If somebody breaks it, it's still a rational requirement. They're just irrational. And there's a lot to be said for that. But another thing we can do is we can blame the theory. We can say the standard picture picks up on some normative considerations, but it doesn't pick up on other normative considerations. 
And when we put those normative considerations back in the standard picture, we get a normatively and descriptively adequate explanation of why people are violating the standard picture. Namely, they were responding to some reasons that weren't in the standard picture. So in particular bound rationality theorists are going to say, look, the standard picture doesn't have bounds. It requires the same things of toddlers, toads, superhumans, um, children. And, um, you know, when you start putting bounds, environments, cognitive abilities, cognitive costs back into the picture, you start getting a different normative theory that can maybe rationalize some descriptive deviations from the standard picture. But that's the idea. It would be easy if we had a theory of bounded rationality. <sighs> a bit hard. Bounded rationality is a paradigm. It's a way we study rationality. There's no such thing as the theory of rationality. But I can at least give you some characteristic claims that this approach tends to make. And these are claims associated with foundational figures like Herbert Simon, like um, Gerd Gigerenz, or like the fast and frugal heuristics folks with fairly central figures in um, the discipline. Of course, the starting point is the claim that bounds matter not only descriptively, but normatively. When you look at bounds like limited abilities, odd implies can, like cognitive costs, costs matter, that's what it means for them to be costs. These bear on rationality and cognition just as much as they bear on rationality of action. You wouldn't say, oh, the cost of a bottle of champagne doesn't matter, so why would you say the cost of thinking about champagne doesn't matter? Second, we're taking a procedural turn. So the fundamental turn has been argued in the study of bounded rationality is a turn from substantive to procedural rationality i.e. we want to focus primarily on studying the rationality of cognitive processes. And when a rational cognitive process produces an irrational attitude, we might want to stress the fact about the rationality of the cognitive process. We don't just think processes in the abstract are important. We have some processes we think we've identified that are often pretty helpful. Namely, we think it's often, not always, but often rational to use some heuristics we got a toolbox of them, things like satisficing, things like lexicographic choice, things like unweighted and linear rules that have been very well studied and often thought to be things that people do and sh should use in many circumstances. So we want to say why that's true. We also want to go environment relative. If you think about reliableists, they said, look, rationality is using a reliable method, okay, but methods are reliable in some situations and unreliable in others. So what we really mean is rationality is using a reliable method in this particular situation that you're in. And likewise, even if you're not concerned about reliability, if you're concerned about other things, speed, effort, if it's within your abilities, if it's going to perform well on other metrics, all of these vary with environments. And so in all of these assessments, you want to relativize the assessment of, say, what's a rational heuristic to use in this environment? And you never ask, what is the rational heuristic full stop? There, there's no such thing. Finally, we got a vindicatory program, right? We want to blame the theory sometimes. So we want to look at many apparent irrationalities, say a lot of things from Kahneman and Tversky. And we want to show that when you put the right theory of bounded rationality into these models, these actually look like straightforward rationalities rather than irrationalities. So that's what a theory of bounded rationality wants to do. That's not a theory. That's a job description for a theory. So what do we need? We need an actual theory that fits the job description. So part two gives you a theory of, well, rational, bounded rationality. It's going to be process focused, so it's going to focus on inquiry. And that's going to help us understand what the account in section two is going to amount to. It's going to help us defend some of these claims we made, and it's going to help us get a little more traction on how to apply them. The view comes in chapter three. The view's got three main components and some subcomponents. The view's a reason responsiveness approach and it's consequentialist, and it's crossed with information sensitivity. So I'm a global consequentialist, not actually straightforward to say what that means. It takes a lot of fussing, but roughly features of agency, whatever you think they are, at least actions and maybe some other things. What makes a feature of agency right? Well, just in case it's best, that is not consequentialism. Kurt Sylvan taught us just about anybody can say that. What makes you a consequentialist is you have a theory of value where the best actions are not the ones that honor the most value, instantiate the most value, put the value on a shelf. The best actions are the ones that best promote value. All right, that's consequentialism. I'm an act consequentialist at the very least, inquiries and actions. So that gets you consequentialism about right inquiry. But we didn't look for a theory of rightness. We looked for a theory of 
rationality. So how do we push this down to a theory of rationality? Um, you can go a lot of ways, but I think a pretty popular approach these days is to go reason responsive. So reason responsiveness, people think, look, what does it mean to say act rationally or more broadly do something suitably agential in a rational way? Well, it means to do the right thing in response to the reasons that make it right, or the rational thing in response to the reasons that make it rational, and so on and so forth. So, you know, if you think a belief's a feature of agency, you might think, what's the right thing to believe when your evidence supports? What does it mean to respond to your evidence at the epistemic basing relation? You put those together, you get evidentialism, and then you push this up to inquiry. You put in global consequentialism instead of evidentialism, and, and this is going to give you, you know, a consequentialist view of rational action, namely um, an act of inquiry is rational just in case it best promotes value and is taken in response to the reasons um, that make it rational. Okay, now we have to think a little bit about the perspective from which reasons are assessed. So until about 20 years ago, there were two games in town, objectivists, you know, reasons are facts and um, otherwise kind of mind independent things. Subjectivist reasons are beliefs. So maybe, you know, an objectivist thinks um, you ought to do what actually promotes the most value in consequentialism. Subjectivist thinks you ought to do what you believe it promotes the most value. I argue neither of these are particularly helpful for bounded agents. We probably want to split the middle, and the most popular way to split the middle these days is to go not belief relative, but not relative to nothing, but rather evidence relative. So an information-sensitive theory, think, you know, Claudine McFarland is just... Um, you know, reasons are given by something like the agent's total evidence or do a Goldberg, the evidence you should have had, something like that. And so that's the view. You go consequentialist about rightness, reason responsive about rationality, lets you push that down to a consequentialist account of rationality. You got to read this not in a subjective way, not in an objective way, but in an information or evidence relative way. All right, chapter four, an injection I get all the time. Now, I think it's important. I get this very often from philosophers, and I think much less from non-philosophers. But the objection I get in philosophy is, look, you're answering the wrong question, David, that consequentialism is historically not regarded as a theory of epistemic rationality, and the project here was to give an account of epistemic rationality. I don't think that should be obvious on the face of it. Until about 10, 15 years ago, orthodoxy was that there were no epistemic norms of inquiry. So it, it should be, I think, taken as a datum that there are epistemic norms of inquiry. We certainly have seen a resurgence in arguments for epistemic norms of inquiry, but there's, I think, a lot to be said for the position that there are not. So I've made softer responses elsewhere. If you like a softer response, it's fine. But um, the response I'm going to go for here is that there are no epistemic norms of inquiry. Rational inquiries, rational action, rational actions, all things considered. You put the action inside the head, it's still all things considered. It, it didn't become a different type of thing just because it was pushed inside of your head. Um, so roughly the argument is this. Look at the reasons we thought there were epistemic norms of belief. There were good reasons. Things like ordinary language says, you know, epistemic rationality tracks evidence and doesn't track pragmatics. Um, knowledge tracks epistemic rationality. Knowledge doesn't, even if you think it shows some kind of pragmatic encroachment, doesn't show the same kinds of encroachment as, say, theories of brightness on a consequentialist view. So a lot of people think for belief, um, non-epistemic accounts of ordinary discourse are either a non-starter or at least capturing something non-central. But if you run all these arguments with inquiry, I've argued they don't work. So you say... Um, you know, um, I don't know. Um, there are no non-epistemic reasons for belief. They're all reasons to get yourself to believe. Okay, great argument. But what is getting yourself to believe? Well, often inquiry. So then you can't say, oh, there are no epistemic, non-epistemic reasons for inquiry. There are really reasons to, you know, metacognize and get yourself to inquire. The buck's got to stop somewhere. And I think it's pretty plausible to stop it here. And so you can go through these arguments here. And actually, I argue a lot of them just in that way are going to start telling against putting um, epistemic norms in inquiry, right? So we had epistemic reasons for belief. We had apparent non-epistemic reasons for belief. We said, no, they're really reasons for inquiry. But then if you say, oh, they're not reasons for inquiry either, then we're in trouble on the belief front. And so maybe we don't want to do that. Um, past couple of years, people have been giving, I think, a little bit thicker arguments for putting epistemic norms on inquiry. That's great. That gives me something to dig in on. So I dig in on some of these arguments and I argue that they're not going to give us enough. All right, so that's the account of rational inquiry, reason responsive, consequentialist, and uh, information sensitive. Then I want to give you three arguments for the account. 
So the argument's an overview, three minimal criteria and in rational inquiry. The best hope for getting them is my account. Explanatory argument, my account explains a lot of things. And a vindicatory program. We wanted to vindicate in kind of a continuous with science way, a lot of claimed irrationalities. And I'm going to give you some vindications that I think look pretty good and only I can give you these vindications. So uh, minimal criteria, three things I think a lot about irrationality theorists want is first trade-offs. Um, Okay, kind of more or less in a bounded rationality, everything trades off. Accuracy and effort trade off, bias and variance trade off. I've argued accuracy and coherence trade off, accuracy and um, complexity, sorry, coherence and complexity trade off. But yeah, accuracy and complexity are probably going to trade off. If you can name it, they trade off. And so, bounded rationality theorists, we confront trade offs every day. We got to say how to make these trade offs. Um, you know, if you think really hard about one inquiry, you got less, fewer resources to think very hard about the other and you got to say okay how do i how do i make that trade off stake sensitivity i'm not usually fond of quoting kahneman but here i'm just fully in agreement when do you think fast when do you think slow well ketter's paribus and ketter's is not always paribus but ketter's paribus think fast about less important matters and think slow about more important matters if there's anything we all agree on it's that we'd better be able to say that um and stereotyping uh Problem is um, a lot of inferences made by stereotyping look very uncomfortably like instances of rational heuristic cognition. There are actually very popular theories that say stereotypes are heuristics. This scares the heck out of me. I do not think stereotyping is often rationally permissible. I think that similar heuristic inferences often would be. So I want an account that says when and why. Um, Something that looks like a stereotype is not a good way to inquire, but if it weren't meeting the stereotyping allegation, then it would be problematic. And I guess you can see trade-offs and stakes are usually pretty good for consequentialists. We've got very clear, precise, explanatory accounts of these, and that's going to come back in Chapter 7. Um, stereotyping is wrong because it harms people. We know that stereotyping is absolutely devastating in terms of the epistemic and non-epistemic harms it causes when you lower the harms, say, by not stereotyping people, then you got a rational inference, but you raise the harms, then you don't. So this is very much in line with someone like Rene Jorgensen who thinks, look, um, you know, the amount of harm that you're risking is going gonna, is gonna, to um, bear on the rationality of stereotyping. Then, okay, the explanatory argument. I think if there's one and only one argument I could ever give for consequentialism. It would be the same I give for science. It, it works. And um, this is a pretty common thing for us to do. We just show that our theory gives pretty clear, pretty precise, pretty mathematical, pretty plausible, pretty scientifically tractable, pretty decision theoretic accounts of phenomena that are hard for other people. So in this section, I look at three. I look at norms of clutter avoidance. Don't clutter your mind with junk, or if you do, maybe get rid of it. Duties of friendship have been, I think, alleged as norms on belief. I want to reinterpret them as norms on inquiry. So instead of, for example, um, believe somebody is innocent because they're your friend. I want to norm like gather some more evidence before concluding your friend is a murderer. And I try to give evidence for this reinterpretation. And also norms of logical non-omniscience. In particular, I'm thinking about applications like chess computers where, you know, the game's trivial if you have logical omniscience. Nevertheless, we don't. And so we have a lot of literature on how and why you might set an appropriate level of logical omniscience, and it has an awful lot to do with costs and benefits. And so I want to tell roughly that kind of a story about logical omniscience as a norm on inquiry. Last argument for um, my theory of bounded rationality is going to start moving into the next thing, which is, you know, using the theory of bounded rationality to loop back to chapter two and tell you all why all those claims um, are good ones. First thing we want to do is vindicatory epistemology. A lot of scientists, a lot of philosophers these days are looking back at some old results and they're saying, no, that wasn't an irrationality. We just misunderstood when and why people were doing what they were doing. And we've got a lot of very you know, good data, very good science, very good explanations behind many of these stories. So I want to tell kind of some of these classic stories in a way that suggests they're probably going to play best for consequentialists. So the first I do is I look at anchoring and adjustment was one of the three um, original heuristics from, you know, the heuristic and biases program. So anchoring and adjustment, you anchor on a specific value and then you iteratively adjust your judgment one at a time by sampling evidence from memory. 
Um, bit awkward because a lot of the things are actually most of the things that have been claimed to be anchoring adjustment are not. They retreat into a broader category called anchoring bias, which we need to take some care to define. But once we do define it, we see, I argue, one, the very few existing instances of anchoring and adjustment are eminently rational by simple trade-offs like the accuracy effort trade-off that a consequentialist can get you. And number two, everything called anchoring bias can be given one of three rationalizing explanations that work often, not all the time. They don't work all the time because humans aren't rational all the time. And then I look at some errors of conditional reasoning. So a, a kind of confirmation task that has been interpreted in um, logical ways. I give a probabilistic reinterpretation following the Bayesians here and a um, consequentialist friendly analysis of why the behavior here might be rational. Okay, so that's um, the account. That's justifying the account. We got a reason responsive consequentialist view, three arguments for the view. Now we got to see what we can do with the view. First thing we got to do is go back to the five things I said were characteristic of bounded rationality in chapter two and show that we can ground them, we can say why they're true, and we can explain them, we can say what they mean. So we did one of them the last chapter was vindicatory epistemology. I do the other four in this chapter. I'm not going to do four in this talk today. I don't want to bore you, but maybe let's do two. Um, so one of them is a claim that bounds matter, um, particular things like limiting cognitive abilities matter and cognitive costs matter. Okay, this is really easy for a consequentialist. So why do limited cognitive abilities matter? Well, odd implies can. Limited abilities um, determine what you can and can't do. And if you can't do it, it's not the case that you ought to do it. And if rationality is a strengthening of ought, right, if it's rightness plus reason responsiveness, it's also going to follow you can't be rationally required to do it if um, you can't do it. Um, why do costs matter? Well, the same reason they always matter for consequentialists. They're in your value function, right? They make the outcome worse. They can be costs in the world, like you spent money, you burned carbon. They can be costs in your head, maybe the opportunity cost of lost time. We've got very good ways of eliciting and measuring these costs, and just use your favorite way to give an account here. So a lot of the Bayesian models in Chapter 7 are actually trying to elicit very precisely how people do and should think about these costs. Another thing I said is, is often rational use heuristics, and roughly there's three standard arguments we make for this. I want to be able to explain them all. Argument one, accuracy effort trade-off. There's often, not always, a trade-off between how much accuracy you want out of judgment formation and how much effort you put in. Why would this be a normative consideration? Well, accuracy is a good-making feature of consequences and effort is a bad-making feature of consequences. So this is just a fancy way of saying costs matter and do trade-offs like a consequentialist always does. Limited abilities is a second argument for heuristics. Look, sometimes the fanciest thing we can do is a heuristic, and so we can't be required to do anything else. And we've already seen that's just not implies can argument that sometimes we get less is more effects. And this is, I think, pretty normatively straightforward. Sometimes with the accuracy effort trade-off flips, and heuristics are both more accurate and less effortful than more complex methods. And when that's the case, we want to say, why are heuristics rational? Okay, anybody can say that, right? They cost you less, they get you more. It's a pretty easy thing for consequentialists to say, although to be fair, anybody else can say that too. Maybe more interestingly, let's go back and think about the standard picture, things like coherence and consistency. So chapter one, I said, look, we're not blaming agents, we're blaming theories. The standard picture is wrong sometimes. We're going to change the standards picture, and we're going to see the standard picture was giving us the wrong answer. That's not what I did. I said, let's take a procedural turn. I'm not writing a book about attitudes. I'm writing a book about the rationality of processes which produce attitudes. Consequentialists have widely thought since the 80s. These are different questions. I gave you a theory of rational inquiry. I did not give you a new theory of rational attitudes. So for all I've said, the standard picture could be right about attitudes. I don't want to say anything more in this book. I have not yet <coughs> substantially revised the standard picture as a theory of rational attitudes. What have I done? I've found a third way. I'm not blaming agents, I'm not blaming theories. Instead of blaming theories, I'm blaming theorists. Okay, there are facts about rational attitudes. Someone had an irrational belief. There are facts about rational processes. They formed it through a rational process of inquiry. Theorists have historically focused most of their attention on the claim about attitudes, which I think is less helpful, and less effort on the claim about inquiry, which is increasingly, I think, more helpful. So the claim is not maybe the standard picture is giving us the wrong answer. It's rather the standard picture might not be asking the most important and revelatory normative question. In cases of interest, 
blaming agents. Okay, so I'm not, you know, blaming agents. I'm not saying the agent and standard picture violations is irrational. I'm not saying take your favorite heuristics and bias experiment. This is irrationality. I'm blaming the attitude. I'm saying, fine, maybe you got a really strict theory of rational attitudes that says, well, cognitive costs matter to processes, not attitudes as double counting. And so unless you form, you know, an incredibly complex, but evidentially supported belief, like um, a complex theorem, you know, unless, unless you got that belief, it's irrational, fine. Okay, maybe you can say that, blame the attitude as irrational, but don't blame the agent because the agent could have only formed that attitude, if at all, through a completely wasteful and irrational process of inquiry. So the thing you want to say again, okay, the attitude is irrational. The process that led to it is rational. If you want to talk about agents as locus of rational assessment, at least not obvious, you would want to go irrationalist here. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is the epistemology of inquiry. I'll use the Friedman term as zetetic epistemology. I think it's pretty well um, known by now that many of us are calling for, and I also want to call for a zetetic turn in epistemology. Don't study doxastic attitudes, belief, and credence, but also study the processes of inquiry that produce them. And I've been really happy to see all the work on this subject. Remember, there's another kind of a turn that is absolutely parallel to this turn. Namely, in practical philosophy, we study a lot of attitudes, intentions, preferences, plans, things like that. That's great. We also want to study the theories of practical inquiry that produce and modify these. Um, and the suggestion, remember, is the fundamental turn to study bounded rationality is the turn from substantive to procedural rationality, i.e. we want to start studying processes more often, attitudes less often. This is at once going to give us a very good argument for taking the epistemic turn in epistemology. We're very happy to see this, but it's also going to give us a new motivation for taking the turn in practical philosophy. There's nothing unique to epistemology here. This is just a kind of a raising of a level or a turn that we need to make in thinking about bounded agents. And in fact, it's going to be easier because if you're worried about, you know, epistemic normativity being about attitudes and not processes in the practical domain, you're, you're not going to have any analogous complaint. Um, also, the good news is bound to rationality can help. So I wrote this book as a book about epistemology. I um, phrased most of my examples, most of my claims in epistemology. At least as much work in bounded rationality has been practical rather than theoretical. And often we're going to get pretty similar lessons. So in particular, I suggest all the main lessons of this book probably can and should be generalized to practical case. And more than that, I think there's a lot, not only that theories of inquiry and epistemology, but also theories of inquiry and bounded rationality can do to help us in epistemology and to help us in practical philosophy. Okay, that's the book. Um, I will try to post some more materials about the book in the coming weeks. I've got some symposia going on. Um, got an infographic, but um, I will let you go. And please do, if you have the time, read a couple chapters of the book, tell me what you think about the book, and um, I hope you enjoy it.